uh, identities are always constructed and in movement so that um, the Catalan identity is a movable identity, right? That reflects the composition of all people that live in Catalonia at a certain uh, moment of time. And, sure. and, and, and in reimagining what a new state can mean, um, we should not reproduce all the pitfalls of you know, standing nation states. In the terms 19th of, century Nathan, yeah, nation state building. Who's included in the nation, who, who has citizenship rights. There are a few nation states in Europe that can trace their origin as more or less the same entity about a thousand years back. But most nations in Europe were created during the 1800s, the century of the nation state. As we all know, there have been numerous mergers, splits, and other uh, border adjustments since then. The question is, are some nations more meaningful than others? Is there such a thing as a natural nation state? What can be gained and what can be lost from Dividing one into two. Welcome to Mind the Shift. I am Anders Bolling. In this episode, we'll talk about the struggle for political freedom, but also about the struggle for gender equality and freedom. Sometimes the two coincide. My guest today is Tanya Vergemestre, a professor of politics and gender at the, the University Pompeo Fabra in Barcelona. She is also an activist at various feminist uh, collectives, including feminist pro-independence groups. And we're here talking about the independence of Catalonia from Spain. Welcome, Tanya. Thank you very much for having me here. So let's begin uh, in a very or fairly recent event. You were uh, just a couple of weeks ago tried in court for an alleged crime that uh, was in connection with the the, uh, the Catalan referendum, but that referendum was three and a half years ago. How how is this possible? How did you? Why did you have to wait for so long? And what were you accused of? Tell us what happened. Okay, so I was accused of usurpation of functions and disobedience as um, being part of. The Electoral Commission of the referendum, this Electoral Commission was appointed by the Parliament of Catalonia. It was integrated by independent um, academics or uh, lawyers working in the private field. And we were charged with supervising the impartiality and the guarantees of effective political participation rights of all citizens, those that wanted to vote yes, those that wanted to vote no or, or abstain. Um, the lawsuit was filed by the public prosecutor back in September 2017, while we had already been um, persecuted by the Constitutional Court, which imposed us a daily fine, so it's a daily fine per person, of 12,000 euros if we did not Day, resign. Daily fine of 12,000? For yes. how long time? How many days? Was, Until was we resign. So okay. uh, these these amounts were so serious, and and they could lead to, you know, um, being directly taken from your bank account if you fail to make the payment. That we were forced to resign. We none of us could afford this twelve thousand euros um, a day. This is this process is part of a series of, of lawsuits and, and trials against uh, pro-independence political leaders that includes members of the of the previous the, the government, Catalan government during the referendum, the president of the parliament of Catalonia, uh, in her case, just for having allowed the independent uh, referendum law to pass. Uh, it includes includes social leaders those um, leading the largest pro-independence organizations. Um, it includes regular activists that have been tried on different charges. So there are over uh, 3,000 people being tried or, or waiting for trial 
in mm. around, well, over 100 cases. In connection um, with that referendum? In connection with the referendum. So so these are all political trials. This is part of a general cause because, you know, the Spanish state, state vis-a-vis the referendum had several options. It could have allowed the referendum, so recognize it, and, and then, uh, depending on the result, establish... Um, so accept the legally binding character of the referendum and accept the results. The state could also have allowed the referendum, but not in a binding way. So mm. depending on the results, then set out some sort of political negotiation. Or it could also have um, not recognized formally the referendum, but just let it happen as yeah. an expression uh, of political participation. But the yeah. option the, the Spanish state chose was the most undemocratic, which, which was beating up voters in the mm. polling stations, as all the world could see, and then imprisoning um, social leaders and political leaders. They have now been over three years in prison, and then launching all these, lodging all these suits against uh, different groups of people. And we believe that in our case, in the case of the electoral commissioners, this is um, an infringement as well of our academic freedom because we didn't have any public position. Uh, it's very common in democratic countries to invite academics to supervise electoral processes. Yeah. Um, and, and this is part of the knowledge transfer we do to, to institutions. We, we regularly put our service um, in the hands of public institutions or social agents in issues related, in topics related to um, the social or the political field as we study them on a daily basis, right? Have you taken this, have you filed this uh, at the European Court of Justice in, uh, in Strasbourg? Well, we are yet in the first stage, so um, we are pending the verdict from the trial. The trial was in early March. Yeah, yes, it was in early March. Uh, tell us more about that. It was two weeks ago and, and you, yes. uh, what happened? What did they, when will you know? <laughs> Um, that's that's quite uh, unforeseeable. The Spanish justice is not characterized by being a very agile judicial system, so we don't know exactly when when the ruling will will appear. If um, we are not acquitted from all charges, which we believe we should, because look, if you look, if you if you, if you um, examine the charges, disobedience. How can we be accused of disobedience if we resign? upon the imposition mm. of these um, excessive fines by the Constitutional mm. Court. Who did we disobey to if we resign? The second one was repatriation of functions. Uh, when we took office, when we were um, appointed as electoral commissions, the, the referendum law was still valid. It had not been suspended um, by the Constitutional Court, so it, it, our activity was legal. And Oh, at that time, but later it was suspended. Yeah, but suspended after doesn't the, mean... After Suspended doesn't mean illegalized. So suspended means that the constitutional court is examining its constitutionality. Okay. Uh, but also usurpation of functions, which entails a two-year prison threat. Um, who are we usurpating functions to? The Spanish mm. Central Electoral Commission does not have among its um, mandates to supervise self-determination referendums, right? So, uh, and for you to usurpate um, someone or some some other body's functions. You need to have, you know, mimicked this, the so falsificated the signatures or mm. use a similar, you know, uh, stamp. Or we did not pretend we were nothing else than the electoral commission for the referendum. So the prosecution didn't provide any evidence for those charges. Mm. So we believe that we can be acquitted from from all the charges. If we aren't, then we we can appeal to a higher court. If this higher court does not um, support our um, appeal, then we can go to the Constitutional Court. And only uh, then you can go to, to Strasbourg. Okay. So, okay. You know, it so it's a process. Out. But these are all Spanish national laws. These are not Catalan laws that you're talking about. That you have supposedly broken Spanish national laws, no, no, no Catalan laws. Exactly. Or, yeah. 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 Okay. Well, you said that Spain, Madrid opted for the most undemocratic uh, 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 way to, to handle this, but uh, uh, as far as I understand, if I if I remember correctly, they they did act. I mean, according to the laws that were in place, they didn't they didn't uh, go. Uh, but it, but of course, as you say, you can always you can always uh, choose to 
to act in different ways, irrespective of what's what's written in the laws and mm-hmm. all that. But if if you follow the 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 letter of the of the law strictly, you might perhaps come to the conclusion that you're entitled to act the way that Madrid acted. That could be one explanation for why they did what they did. That has been disputed by both Amnesty International, the Trois de 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 l'Homme organization in France, by the Committee Against um, Arbitrary Detentions of the United Nations. So on the one hand, we have the issue of this being a political conflict. It should not be addressed with the criminal code. There's no political conflict in the world, at least in the democratic states, that could be expected to be resolved just using the criminal code, right? Um, secondly, what we have here is, is um, an understanding by the Spanish state of the rule of law as lawfare, because actually holding non-authorized referendums is not included in the criminal court. Uh, sorry, mm-hmm. in the criminal code, it is not a crime. It can be an administrative fault if you want, but not a crime. It is not, I mean, you can only be charged um, with crimes that are included in the criminal court. So this mm-hmm. was not in the criminal court. It, it's not yet in the criminal court. Mm-hmm. Um, politician, the social leaders who have been in prison for over three years now have been charged with um, sedition, sedition. Um, yeah. Which is a, a, a crime that that's been typically imposed on dissidents since you know yeah. the, the ancien regime, um, yeah. just for um, being in Rebe- a demonstration. It's like, it's like rebe- the same thing as rebellion or something something similar. Well, there are some nuances because one would imply the use of um, arms. Uh, mm-hmm. There were no arms. I mean, the Catalan pro independence movement does not use any type of violent uh, means. So this. So much, so flexible understanding of the the, the, the imputed crimes is, is this lawfare practice because a demonstration cannot be sedition. Otherwise, and we are seeing this more generally in Spain, the, the laws have been passed in the previous years that were addressed to the Catalan mm-hmm. movement to, that mm-hmm. were um, passed to contain the, the, the independence claims have implications for other social movements. So mm. now other social movements can also be accused of sedition when the demonstration is very large or when civil disobedience is applied. So it could be a slippery slope if we if it we're is. unlucky it, here. We're already seeing that with the, mm. the rappers, for example. That are yeah, being, this rapper that's been uh, yeah, arrested there's now. An What's illiberal, his name again? There's an illiberal uh, tendency in how some rights are interpreted. So it affects the, the freedom of speech, the, the right to, to assembly and to demonstration. Yeah. So there, there, the Spanish state had other options on the table mm. rather than using the criminal code. Yeah, it, it does make sense what you say, of course, that they could have let this referendum just uh, be carried out and, and just um, pretend that nothing happened. And, and, but then after that, of course, if the, let's say, it's, I, I think it was only a little less than 50% of the population that voted in it anyway. So, mm-hmm. But let's say it's, it's, it was a large part of the Catalonian population population that voted and and the big majority voted for secession uh, then of course uh, the government in barcelona would have st- would have begun to to dismantle uh, its nation from spain would, would have begun to 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 take measures to to break away from spain and then maybe madrid would have had uh, some kind of in, um, incentive Reaction, to, yeah. to, to, mm-hmm. to act but not in the in this at this instant when you just had the referendum but mm-hmm. exactly. is that what you're saying um, yeah that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Some years ago, and this is in relation to the, um, to the Basque country, when ETA was still operating, the terrorist group ETA was operating, mm. all Spanish statewide political parties and the Spanish government were saying, look, without violence, we can talk about everything. Okay, the Catalan pro-independence movement does not use violence, but still mm. it cannot be. There are some issues that are not on the table. Mm. Um, and and I said, other countries, and we have uh, immediate examples, right? This is Scotland and the UK. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I cannot imagine the UK deploying the use of force and applying the criminal court, uh, the criminal court against yeah. Alex Salmon or Nicola Sturgeon for mm-hmm. holding a referendum, even if London does not approve it. 
it yeah. might ignore themselves. Well, it, it, it hasn't happened yet, so we, we don't know. But um, you yeah, have but, a case uh, point. I was going to ask about this. It's really interesting. It's it's a very interesting But what parallel. we have is another example of... Because they uh, did, I mean, London did accept the uh, the referendum. They even... The, it did the accept the referendum it, and yeah. it imposed some conditions. So in the Spanish, in the in the in the Scottish case, the preference was not for a binary referendum. It was a, a, a threefold referendum. So a yes, yeah. uh, no, and and Bevo Max, which which was a devolution of of more um, powers to Scotland, which was at the time the preference of the Scottish National Party. But but yeah. the the um, the UK government imposed a type of referendum that. Uh, that's a uh, political strategy. They thought they could win if they polarized the referendum around just two options. Mm. So in, in the Spanish case, the, the Spanish government might could have accepted the referendum, but not a binary one, but the three, uh, a three response referendum, including, you know, some sort of asymmetrical federalism or some, some sort yeah. of uh, revision of the constitution. And, and, and the Spanish state might have won the referendum. Mm -hmm. uh, depending on what was on the table. Yeah, yeah, let's say, for instance, that Catalonia had the same rights as the Basque country has to to uh, keep their own taxes, for instance. Their yeah, own tax I, I'm system. not sure if by the time that would have been enough, because the Spanish state has a long history of non-compliance uh, with its own uh, commitments in terms of uh, the evolution of powers, in terms of interference, with exclusive powers of the region or abusing mm. from the shared powers to define more than just the basic laws, but impose uh, specific approaches to the, to the regions. Um, I think one, the, the, the economic crisis was much of a catalyzer um, to the independence movement rather than mm. not having this, um, this um, Basque or Navarra um, tax system. Because it, it was very clear that when when the Catalan government wanted to pass policies that could help people um, get through the crisis, such as, for example, anti-addiction laws or laws um, forbidding the energy companies to to cut the supply of gas mm -hmm. of um, of other sorts of energy to low-income families, these laws were all suspended, and they were suspended because um, the centralized centralist vision was imposed no because it's breaking the, Span the spanish market unity mm -hmm. so it, it's not about um not wanted to participate in a redistribution of resources which at least from a left-wing perspective this is totally fine but it's about not having the capacity to respond to your citizens to your own population right mm -hmm. um because the, the state always have the, the, has the capacity to curtail public action on a daily basis with this type of social policies also. Um, you know, I'm so old that I, I remember the Franco days. <laughs> I was I was even in, in Spain a couple of times when I was a kid during Franco era. And at that time, you could absolutely talk about a centralized state. I mean, it, that was completely centralized. You weren't even allowed to speak Catalan in Catalonia and so on. So I think mm. many, many things have happened since then, as you might well uh, recognize, of course, but that doesn't mean that we have to compare with the Franco days. But still, um, if, as an outsider, you could you could have the impression, get the impression that Spain is almost a federal country, but the, so many regions have their own uh, laws and own rights. And, uh, you know, Basque country is the most extreme example. Then we have Catalonia, we have Galicia, and we have, uh, to some extent, uh, the Canary Islands and the Balearic Islands. Mm -hmm. and, and they're all... The, the, these comunidades autonomas, uh, they have some, I mean, it's, it's a little bit like, German, but it's, it's kind of a mixture because it's not completely federal. And it's uh, so it's never been federal. But it, no, I know. Maybe maybe that would be the solution. Or do, what do you think would be? Well, so, some years ago, stupid question. we're going to talk about uh, Catalonia. Oh, but some, anyway, some you, you can ago, answer if you want. Some years ago, I think that might have been a solution. Yeah. But for, a, for a, first of all, Federal states or the federal category, the federal level doesn't mean much because federalism is implemented in very different ways in different yeah. countries. Yeah. So that the country is decentralized, as is the Spanish case, it's, it's, it's very decentralized. But this decentralization should be examined in light of, well, um, volume of um, the budget or services directly provided to the citizenship, but also um, the capacity that regions have 
to make political decisions. Mm. So if the state is decentralized, but you only manage the budget, so you're like a service provider rather than having political capacity to define how you want the services to be provided, when you want to enlarge the services or when you want to include other policies, including in the area of gender equality, part of the Catalan equality law was also suspended by the Constitutional Court because it didn't, um, again, it, it did not um, fit with the statewide um, labor law. But it, it, it's so ridiculous in some regards. For example, articles that were suspended were related to the inclusion of the gender perspective in the prevention of risk at the, at the um, um, uh, factory level, for example. So taking care for the health of um, pregnant women while dealing with you know, chemicals or other type of um, products. So these suspensions do not make sense. So rather than having you know, this bottom-up effect in which there, there might be legislative innovation at the regional level and then the statewide level just broadens the scope, because we are not talking about, you know, in constitutionality of th this is not illegitimate, it's an, it's an advancement, right, in, in the social um, field. Well, this is always yes. contained. And the Spanish government has the capacity when lodging an appeal to the constitutional court to, to, to provoke the immediate suspension of these laws, even before the, the court itself decides on the constitutionality. So, yes, it is a very decentralized country. It doesn't mean it is federal, because for mm -hmm. federalism or this idealized form of federalism in which there is an equilibrium between the center and, and, and the sub-central um, sub unit entails that there must be uh, enough self-government and self-government must mean political decision-making capacity, not just managing of budgets and services, and mm. then shared rule. So mm. how joint decisions are made with the center. And shared rule in Spain is non-existent. There is mm. a Senate which basically duplicates what the lower house does. There's no, there is representation from the regions, but this is, it, it is organized across party lines, not across regional lines. Regions do not have veto power capacity on those laws that might affect the operation of the distribution of powers within, within the state. Um, the, the, the regions have a marginal presence in decision-making related to Spain's position before the EU, for example. Um, and, and we could, you know, provide further yeah. examples. There, there's no yeah. shared role. There's no shared role at all. I guess it's a hybrid in, in a way. Spain is a hybrid nation. It is. And, and the, what we have seen since the transition to democracy is that uh, decentralization or the, the recognition of, of, of self-government was a demand that basically came from the Basque Country, Catalonia, and to a lower extent, Galicia. Um, but the, the model that was imposed is one in which homogenization was the plan mm -hmm. um, for all regions. And, and some regions were created out of the blue. They didn't make sense according to previous frontiers within um, the yeah. frontiers, administrative divisions within the country. So, Wh Which ones, for example? You mean like Cantabria oh Madrid or? was totally made up. Madrid, Madrid, Madrid of course, Madrid yes. Did not exist as such. Uh, Murcia did not exist as such. There were several that that mm. were not were never part of. Uh, you know, historically speaking, they were never integrated in such a unit as they stand now. Um, yeah. Well, so yes, all states are reinvented. They impose new divisions, but mm. what I mean is that the self-government demands were only uh, part of some regions, not others. So there's been a constant interpretation by central governments and the constitutional go, uh, court towards homogenization. Uh, and this homogenization has nothing but per se. I mean, there are other regions that want to join the club in this regard to, to, to self-govern themselves in several domains is fine. But it, mm. it should not be um, an excuse to push down those regions that would like to have more self-government. I understand, yeah. We'll get back to the, the details about that and also about gender equality and how it how it coincides with the independence movement. I just want to get a little bit personal here first uh, and uh, talk about this thing from an emotional standpoint, perhaps or not. We'll see. You know, I've been to Spain more times than I can remember now. I think it's probably around 50 or so. Mm -hmm. And I've been to Catalonia many times. I think I've been to Barcelona maybe 10 times or so. And um, I, I love that city, I love that region, and I love the rest of Spain. 
many parts of it. I love Madrid and I love Andalusia. <laughs> there are so many different places that are wonderful and wonderful people everywhere. And when the independence movement began to act, get active, maybe it was around the time of the financial crisis. You mentioned that that was mm -hmm. yeah more or less like 10, 12, 13 years ago. I was first a bit surprised, and then I was a bit annoyed <laughs> as a as a person coming from the outside like this, and also frustrated because I consider myself a globalist. I mean, in in the positive sense, uh, not not in that strange sense that some left wing people have it, but a globalist who has a dream of a world without borders, without perhaps nation states at all. And then here was this independence movement. I didn't understand it. But then lately I've realized that this is a real strong sentiment as you are surely, um, clearly showing here. And, and I have also seen and read and understood that Madrid has acted terribly towards the independentistas and, uh, and the independence movement. So first, why break away What's the first primary reason for this? Is this prim primary, primarily out of love for Catalonia or is it primarily out of resentment towards Spain? Oh, I, I, I totally rule out resentment. Resentment, or at least resentment for Spanish. Catalonia is, is one territory in which uh, half the population has its parents or grandparents born in, in other parts of Spain. So it has nothing to do where um where you have born or how many um how many family members in your family history are originally from Catalonia it has nothing to do it so it's it's not a an ethnic nationalism um I, it has to do with um resentment in any case towards the constant infringement of self government i think this this is a historical pattern within spanish history every time there's been a democratic opening and, and we could go back to the early 20th century and then the Second Republic, Catalonia, the socialized, um, civil mm. so uh, sorry, the, the organized civil society and, and some political parties have also claimed for self-government um, and for the establishment of, of um, uh, Catalonia. This was in the 30s before the civil war. Yeah, well, it was first in the in the in the the first uh, the first decades of the twentieth uh, century, where um, the provincial administrations were um, were were collapsed for the first time in what's called the mancomunitat. So um, it mm -hmm. was it, it was not self government as we understand it today, but it was uh, a proto generalitat, which is the name of the current Catalan government, and then in the Second Republic again. Um, and and the, this constant infringement, I'm talking about the, the more recent um, democratic times, as I told you before, it's, um, it, it's becoming, so it, it's very present on, on the daily that lives of, of people. Sometimes Catalan pro-independence movement has been presented as a selfish, rich, um, bourgeois country and compared to... Yeah, because Liga Catalonia is the richest, one of the richest regions. So many people up from the outside think that, oh, they're just, uh, you know, they don't want to share their wealth with the rest of Spain, the poor parts of Spain. That's what many say. Yeah, but that's, well, that, that, that would be a, a, an ecological fallacy, right? So Catalonia is in itself also diverse, and, and I'm speaking here from a, from a left-wing pro-independence perspective, so I wouldn't share any, any, any of those arguments. But when we talk about the distribution of resources and, for example, the lack of investment of the Spanish state on Catalonia, um, we are talking, well, in terms of big infrastructures, but also on the daily infrastructures that the infrastructures people used to commute. So mm -hmm. we, we see, so just as, as examples of this economic grievance, which is not the, the, the sole motivation, but how it, 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 it affects citizens in their daily lives, not the bourgeois that do not want to share the resources. So if you go to work every day and, and you don't know at what time you'll get to work, on, or you're facing, um, you know, periodical um, failures in the train service, the commuting service, and this, this is due to the investment for decades by the Spanish state. Well, there are more and more uh, fast speed trains being uh, built elsewhere. Um, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense because that's that that's that's how the people feel the state on a daily basis. Or, well, or that's, as I was like, saying, that's the same the same thing in any country. It's the same in Sweden. We don't have these kinds of independence movements, but parts of 
regions in Sweden are complaining that Stockholm is not sending enough money to build railways and roads up in the north, for instance. I, I think mm-hmm. that's something that's very common in, in most countries. Well, it might be, but what I'm saying is, well, this part of the economic grievance has to do with this basic daily needs, right? Or with the fact that, I don't know, uh, when the Catalan government um, imposed a one cent tax on gas to, to help finance the health system, it, this was also declared an inconstitutional measure. So there's, there's, there's so strong limitations on how self government can, can be implemented in practice on how, uh, what's the margin of maneuver that governments, and in this case, Dublin governments, right, could, could try to could implement uh, different um, policies. And that, that, that's what I was saying. In the economic crisis, it was more evident than, than ever, right? That when mm. you want to rescue citizens rather than banks, the Spanish state does not allow you to. Um, um, anti-evictions policies, um, poverty, energy poverty, equality laws, um, and anti-fracking laws. So you, you cannot even protect the environment with your own tools because this these laws have also been suspended. So at the end, um, this adds up to the fact that in 2010, the Constitutional Court decided on the revised Catalan Statute of Autonomy, which had been approved in 2006 by the lower house, the, 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 the Madrid lower house, because mm-hmm. this is an organic law. It's first drafted in the Catalan parliament, then goes to the, to the Spanish parliament, and then it's, it goes back to Catalonia and it's voted on referendum. Well, in the first uh, trip from the Catalan parliament to the Spanish parliament, the statute itself, the, the Catalan constitution, was already severely uh, curtailed. It was already um, impoverished, impoverished in terms of the demands being made. And that was Catalonia's federal proposition to the Spanish state. That was the, the, that was the, the, the claim that this, the current arrangement doesn't work. We, need more, we want more self-government and we also want recognition for our cultural rights. Yeah. Um, and the Spanish uh, lower house um, significantly um, reduce the, the content of the claims by deleting, um, excluding several of the of the articles, and then the constitutional court just destroyed it. And and it has so this this has entailed a strong legitimacy problem because well, where's where's the sovereignty here? So the Spanish government, uh, the, sorry, the Spanish parliament already um, diminished, right? Um, the Catalan people's sovereignty with a document, with a constitution that was unanimously supported by all Catalan parties. So we are not talking of pro-independence parties drafting um, a proposal, but it was all politi- Catalan political parties, including mm. uh, unionist parties that at the time were, didn't use this level. Right? Um, and then uh, significantly uh, curtailed by the constitutional court. So, what's the pact? Uh, that that rejection triggered the independence movement as it is now. It did because if that was the federal proposal, and and it is not even accepted. So, mm. what I, I had forgotten that, but I, I remember when you told me. What's yeah. Spain's proposition for Catalonia? It, it, is it just submission? Like, so it it, it just not listening to the political yeah. claims, not not being um, not being yeah. willing to discuss. What are the limits of current arrangements? The constitution it, it, it is itself very open in terms of how the territorial structure of the state can be organized. But the interpretation that the Spanish constitutional court and the main Spanish political parties are doing is, is very restrictive. Mm. And they constantly invite Catalan for independence party to present a revision of the constitution in the Spanish parliament, which mm. is kind of, you know, a joke. If you allow me, because this is an issue of political majorities and political minorities. You cannot ask a political minority to submit a proposal that's going to be rejected immediately. Because for a constitutional reform to pass, you need the majority of the two houses, the lower house, the the upper house. You need a referendum on all Spanish citizens. And then the newly elected uh, lower house and upper houses need to ratify it. There's no way in which a political minority 
has the sufficient number of votes to resolve it. And, and this is why other countries, such as for Canada, for example, when presented with demands from, from Quebec. Quebec, the constitutional court say, well, the constitution does not foresee this type of referendums, but this is about the democratic principle. If there is sufficient support, there's um, in a democratic country, there should be the possibility to consult with the people. And then the, the, um, the, the, the uh, number of yes, the, mm. the, 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 bold the, result the, mm. the results should be sufficiently clear, right? Mm. Before mm. you ask me, well, only about half the Catalan population participated in the referendum. Of course, this uh, amount of, this level of participation would be insufficient to implement any, any result, let alone the repression capacity of the Spanish state, but it would be insufficient mm. in terms of legitimacy. Yet, I would not say this is a low percentage of participation because it, it, it was uh, observed in a context of police brutality, police mm. beating mm. voters. Mm. Um, so all taken... All, yes, in, all a, in a more like, normal context, in a more, a more calm and democratic context, uh, probably more people would have, would have voted. Exactly. Which doesn't say anything about the result, of course. I, I'm sure no. there are a lot of people in, in Catalonia who don't Of course, don't it would have been more, more, more balanced. Mm. I think about 50%. It's still a 50-50, a 50-50 affair between those who want to secede from Spain and those who don't, as far as I yes, understand. Yes, but I think that the, it, it might change if the question that, that, that uh, people are asking survey yes. is about uh, an agreed referendum. Yeah, it's always because about that, the question. That changes the, the willingness to participate and also mm. the, the, the share of well, yeah. and, and also if you have an option to secede in I mean you can secede in different ways you can secede because I mean Catalonia is where it is geographically it will mm -hmm. never be able to float away from Spain so it would always have mm -hmm. to have strong connections with Spain and as you say half mm -hmm. the population has were born or have parents who were born in other parts of Spain so it's there's there mm -hmm. are strong connections so I mean maybe you could you could formulate the questions in a way that shows people that well we will secede and we will be kind of a nation but but we will still have strong bonds, strong ties with Spain, as well as with the European Union and France and all other countries that we want to be connected with. Of course. With. Then maybe may a lot more people would, would, would I'm, vote I'm for that. I'm not sure about that. I, I think it, it all falls upon, uh, upon Spain's um, reaction and willingness. Yeah, but I mean, uh, re regardless it. of Madrid's reaction, yeah. I was just thinking yeah, about how I mean, you formulate the I mean, question. Pro independence parties, um, th th there's a general consensus that, for example, uh, both Catalan and Spanish would be co-official languages. So no mm -hmm. one, no one's um, identity or, or uh, mother tongue would feel threatened by independence. Mm -hmm. um, there was also there's also consensus that both a Spanish and Catalan nationalities would be compatible. But mm -hmm. this is something that a, any country can say. It needs to be recognized by the other part as well. Yeah. So if Spain recognizes the double nationality, then mm -hmm. It's a it's a bilateral agreement, right? Yeah. So Catalonia has already said, and when I say Catalonia, well, pro-independence um, um, yeah. political parties or, or civil society does not have any problem with these connections. This yeah. is not an issue. Uh, it, 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 this this um, that this is a civic movement that um, has the ambition to be inclusive um, mm. in several well in in, in terms of how. The new state is built in terms of citizenship, so I don't see any problem from from this. Um, I don't see any problem in this regard. It has more to do with whether the Spanish state will ever be um, um, ready mm. for stop using the criminal court and opening mm. a political negotiation that includes. I think there's no solution to this conflict until a referendum. Proper referendum. You see no movement within the Spanish government, within the Spanish leadership, towards uh, a willingness to to solve this problem in a democratic and peaceful way. The language, regardless is uh, if they're left or right. The language is different when when the PSOE is in government, yeah. but in practice, there are not many movements being okay. made in different directions. Um, and what, what's and the, the state of play right now between? Catalonians and Madrid right now what's what would you say is a state of play is it a stalemate or is anything happening at all it it has a component of a stalemate because um 
the changes in the Spanish party system have also meant that there's um, the the single party governments are no longer um, viable. That the, the 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 party that wins the elections um, in in the general elections still needs to craft a coalition um, in two thousand. Regional parties. Oh, um, sorry. Well, not necessarily. You, you, we now have, uh, well, there is the coalition government between the PSOE and, and, and United We Can, a radical left party, but still they don't have the majority of votes. And then they, they rely on other um, parties within, um, within the chamber. Yeah. And, um, and within the pro-independence movement in Catalonia, left-wing parties are hegemonic. So they, they do now have the majority of, of seats and, and votes in both general elections and Catalan elections. Mm-hmm. Um, so um, this is still made in some ways and implies that um, the, the, the PSOE needs to secure these votes. But again, this, this commitment problem, there's been no changes in terms of how the Spanish state is reacting um, in, in terms of repression, for example. Um, the public um, prosecutor still keeps challenging um, the penitentiary rights that the political prisoners have. So mm. because they have been now over three years or two years and a half in prison, yeah. they are entitled to... Um, How many are they? Ten, nine or ten leaders nine. from the... Nine, yeah. Nine in prison and then several... Conqueras is in prison, is it? Yes. Mm-hmm. And and uh, Puigdemont is, uh, is in, in exile. exile. Yeah. yeah, so imagine having the, the leaders of the main political parties of any single territory, right? Either in prison or in exile. No, this is not so. If the PSOE wants to send a clear signal, there can be no negotiation with hostages. Mm-hmm. This is not a fair negotiation, right? With no. people in prison, with people in exile, um, uh, w- w- with threats of ele- 10, 11, 13 years in prison, there cannot be any political negotiation. So I, I don't, I don't understand how how the Spanish government. Is, is proceeding in this case because the, the referendum itself was an, was an emotional fracture because mm. some people say, well, it could have been expected that the Spanish state would react in this way because mm. the transition to democracy was not that exemplary as it's explained in the textbooks. Um, it was a pact between the, the, the regime forces and, and mm. democratic forces, but that secure amnesty for mm. all for our criminals from the Franquist regime, and there was no transition in the armed forces, in the judiciary, or in in some um, ranks of the public administration. So these these uh, powers are not that they do not have a democratic culture, mm. um, and and we are seeing the consequences nowadays. The, the Spanish well, yeah. is part of um, their lead motives, and they are willing to deploy any any means. It's obvious that there is a lot of nationalism, uh, centralist nationalism, and prestige in this. But you can see that, for example, in a case like Kosovo, because Madrid doesn't even want to uh, acknowledge Kosovo as a nation <laughs> because they are afraid that that would um, give a precedent for mm-hmm. regions like Catalonia and others to secede. So mm-hmm. it's it's a bit ridiculous, really. But anyway, to go back to the my former question here, judging from what you have been explaining and telling us here. I take it that uh, the reason why you are pro-independence is more uh, is, it has less to do with Catalonia and all Cat- and the Catalonian culture than with the structures and the system. Is that correct? Well, I think we should take into account this concept of intersectionality. So I, I am not just a left-wing feminist uh, pro-independence uh, woman. I am all of those at the same time. Yeah. Um, so, so yeah, I do have a gender, I do have a class, I do have a race, I do have a national identity, and and these all are combined. So, why I do an independence has to do with all this interconnection of political claims. Um, what what's been interesting, or what's an interesting debate, is how nationalism and feminism have very often been presented or characterized as antagonistic, right? Because the um, the, the, the nation nation state building processes were quite inegalitarian in terms of gender, with women portrayed as the mother of the nation and 
reinforcing traditional roles, um, but there are also experiences of transformative uh, national movements in the global south, right? Um, or as the Scottish case or the Catalan case or the Basque case um, demonstrate, right? So this alignment between this old fashioned conservative supremacist nationalism does have nothing to do with contemporary civic expressions of nationalism, right? And this is compatible with um, uh, other movements that seek to further uh, transformation, uh, social yes, you transformation. You said that fem- feminism ha- can contribute to rethinking the mm-hmm. nation state. So how, how is that? It could contribute to rethink identities, to, to make them be less... Um, Ethnic based and 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 to understand that uh, identities are always constructed and in movement, so that um, the Catalan identity is a movable identity, right? That reflects mm-hmm. the composition of all people that live in Catalonia at a certain uh, moment of time, and, sure. and 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 in reimagining what a new state can mean, um, we should not reproduce all the pitfalls of, you know, standing nation states. In the terms 19th of, century nation, yeah, nation state building. Who's included in the nation, who, who has citizenship rights. Um, so this, or how do we want to construct a new social con- uh, uh, contract, right? How do we make this social contract? Well, taking into account the different positionality, right? As um, natives, as migrants, as um, people of color, as uh, people from different in- uh, incomes, right? So if you don't take into account all these different positionalities, we will imagine and we will define institutions that only reflect the expectations and interests of those who are already privileged. So feminist uh, pro-independence activists have been producing several um, well books, blogs, uh, with reflections as regards the, the, the nation, the citizenship, the culture, how to conceive of health policies or economic policies, right, that take into account um, all these different axes of, of inequality. And, and I think there's a common thread amongst these um, new forms of uh, pro-independence movements. Mm-hmm. Uh, in Scotland, for example, Women for Independence have this motto, which is Women for Independence, Independence for Women. And, and in Catalonia, for example, Feminists for Independence claim independence from centralism, patriarchy, and capitalism. So yeah. it, it, these are um, windows. Well, it of sounds like something that, that women everywhere would, would strive for, regardless of whether if they are belonging to a region that one is to see or, or, or not. Yeah, but but exactly, it's together. it's redefining the boundaries of a state, deciding yeah. on what issues are on the table um, in terms of how to design structures, which policies mm-hmm. are central. Um, the, the, the feminist thought is um, is very active in making proposal. I'm not saying that we have been very effective. Um, this is a uh, this is a tension, right? We are invited to to speeches to deal with the women's question or the feminist question, but we want to sit in tables in which um, the, the, the theme is the economy or security, mm. yeah. right? Um, security is a very And then you have this specific, specific input that can... Exactly. And, and, and security is, is, an, is an excellent example. It's sometimes we are in tables and, and, secu- and, and the debate is about should Catalonia have an army or not? And sometimes the the answer, the most the most common answer is yes, because you know we share borders with France and Spain. And the feminist response is well, they, based on um, on on the peace tradition of the feminist movement, that well, a new country in 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 the middle of Europe should not have an does not first does not need an army and should not have an army. But these resources can be devoted um, to other. Uh, that types of policies, but the argument that because the front the frontiers we share with Spain and France are so absurd, how many mm-hmm. how many what's the volume of the army Catalonia would need to confront the France <laughs> and Spanish uh, armies together militaries? It doesn't make sense, right? Um, so so it's about uh, as I was saying, getting into these debates and 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 broadening the agenda, right? It, uh, it, we we can still have uh, policies that help. 
uh, humanitarian action uh, that help develop peace processes around the world when needed. So you don't need to have an army, even if it's a sort of humanitarian army type, you can contribute to peace building um, and reconstruction in very yeah. different ways. And, Costa and Rica this, doesn't have an army. And exactly. It's between and, countries that and, have armies. And this fits also into Catalan tradition in which the opposition to the mandatory military service was very strong in the 1970s, 80s, and, 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 and 90s. So people were going to prison because they were objecting, uh, consciously objecting to, to, to um, taking part in the military service. So, I, so it fits with um, this peace tradition uh, in social movement, several social movements in, in Catalonia. Well, that would be just one example, you know, in terms of reimagining how, how, how states can work in the, in the 20th century. Yeah. You know, the My Country Sweden has a uh, stated f feminist foreign policy. Uh, you're probably aware of that because you, you, mm -hmm. you're teaching these things. What do you think of that? Does it Have you followed it? Have you studied the Swedish example? And I mean, I, I can't say that I can see that there is a big difference between how it used to be. But anyway, it's it's on paper. Yeah, I have not been following the specifics of the implementation and especially the coherence of the implementation. But, uh, for example, in the, the Spanish Foreign Office is now claiming to uh, design a feminist foreign policy, which is presenting as, well, uh, gender balance amongst the diplomatic corps, um, promoting gender equality in international conferences, and, and feminist activists, beyond being pro-independence or not, are saying, well, this, this is not coherent with selling um, military ammunition to Yemen or to Syria or to have this um, Europe frontier idea in, in, in North Africa, in this uh, enclaves of Southern Melilla, mm -hmm. right? Or, or, or imprisoning uh, non documented migrants in these uh, international centers uh, just for an administrative, um, for, for a lack of an administrative paper, right? So a feminist foreign policy would not just um, paint in, in pink color the composition of the diplomatic corps, it, it would be more coherent in terms of how you relate to other countries. Um, how you deploy your resources for for developing countries in more horizontal ways and engagement with civil organization civil society organizations. So uh, I'm not I'm not sure whether this is securing as well in Sweden, but in the Spanish case, this is just a mere it's a facade. It's not true that um, mm -hmm. even if it's claimed to be uh, a feminist foreign policy, when you look at the broader picture, you cannot depict it as feminist. No, but it sounds like you're dreaming more of a, of organizing a society, a nation, uh, on out uh, from other other points of view than 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 have been the case has been the case since since the 19th century when, when the nation states were created, more than than so to speak um, build a new nation state uh, from the perspective of cultures or or ethnic grounds or so. And so, I think, if you, it, I think that would be a lose lose strategy. Yeah. Um, yeah. We live in a, in a more fluid society. And this does not mean um, that we would not uh, protect cultural rights. I mean, mm. the, one, one of the um, elements yeah, that have also mm, distanced. Let's say that Madrid, that, that the rest of Spain also adopts these thoughts and these ideas and these dreams that you, the, the visions that you have. And your group. Let's let's just say that for for the sake of argument. Then uh, it would be probably natural to dissolve the border between Catalonia and Spain again, and and just everyone in this area would have this <laughs> wonderful uh, society where where feminist feminist principles are are basic, and also uh, respect for cultures and respect for people's needs and and all those things. Well, what I'm saying is that this. Um state building processes after independence are constitutive of in, an institutive moment. So you mm. can have the chance to redesign uh, things in very different ways. This is why um, it, it's worth to have all this um, thought development and how things would be different and how to guarantee that it is as inclusive as possible since the very beginning. Now, um, there are different hypothetical scenarios in terms of whether um, 
an independent Catalonia might eventually rejoin um, Spain or have a, some 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 form of federation or confederation. I, I think anyway. I think the only um, red line here is the recognition of sovereignty, mm. because for any for any group of territories to um, to join forces or to unite, if there's not this recognition of being equals in terms of decision making capacity then it's not a credible, um, a credible, respectful union, so to say. Mm. You, as you say, you have the, when, you, when you build a new na- nation, you have the possibility of uh, redoing things, doing things better uh, than before. But then you can be a role model. I mean, you can act as a role model for other countries and maybe other, others can see that, oh, they're doing it much better than we did and they're a good example, so let's follow them. And then eventually borders can dissolve I mean, we have the European Union, after all, and, and I think the mo- that most Catalan people uh, like the European Union and like mm-hmm. uh, the principle of being able to, as a region, and cooperate with no- Brussels uh, instead of with Madrid. So, I mean, there's... Uh, but there, there's, there's no or. It can be an. I mean, th- uh, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Th- th- there's no resentment exactly. against Madrid as a capital city itself. Mm-hmm. It's what it implies in terms of vulneration, infringement of the mm-hmm. sovereignty or of, of, of the, the rest of um, regions in Spain. Um, I think that it wouldn't make sense for the European Union to, to, to leave Catalonia out from the, from the Union. No. Uh, and, 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 and I do have my concerns about the European Union from a left-wing perspective, but, it, but it, mm. in the, this discussion, it goes beyond the point. Um, so having border, borders between France and Spain doesn't make sense. Mm. Uh, I guess, from, a, from an economic perspective uh, for the European Union's interest. And, and the European Union at the end is a, is a union of states. So mm. I, unless Spain... Well, that's what you had when you started, when you started creating it. You had states, so you had, that's what you had to build on, mm. I guess. But it, it, can, it, it can evolve into something different if, if, mm-hmm. if uh, the nations want that and if the peoples want that. But look, what's funny, both in Catalonia and in the in in Scotland, one of one of the arguments made by the unionists was, if you leave the union, you'll be left floating in the space, and particularly you'll be out of the European Union. Um, well, the Scottish case has demonstrated that well, yeah. the Europeanists were uh, a majority in in there, and now they are out of the European Union against their will, right? Yeah. Um, so I, I don't I don't see um, why a new state born out of a secession um, mm-hmm. that wants to join the European Union, and especially given the geographic location, um, would be banned from um, entering the union. Of course, there are these veto powers um, that that states have, but um, it, it it would not be because Catalonia might not want to be part of the European Union because the majority of the population is strongly uh, Europeanist. Yeah. You mentioned also uh, before the and interview... An, sorry, an anti-Europeanism. It, it, so it's not, not, not so much anti-Europeanism, but it's more left-wing criticism of how the, Uni- the European Union works in terms of being a union of markets rather than um, furthering protections in terms of social rights which the European Union has tended to set the very minimum non-discrimination regulation, but not established standards um, for the different for the different countries. And in terms of um, gender equality or LGTB rights, again, yes, minimum standards of non-discrimination, but when countries um, vulnerate, uh, violate human rights, what's mm-hmm. the response? What response is giving uh, the European Union to Hungary or, or Poland? With restrictions on on LGTB uh, people or women's right to um, to their bodies, right? In terms of um, abortion, nothing happens. In fact, yeah, some, but, some countries but, where but that's because because I mean you, the European Union, Brussels is the twenty seven nations and the, the twenty seven capitals, as you know. I mean, yeah, yeah. it doesn't really matter what what uh, Ursula von der Leyen says mm-hmm. because she doesn't have she doesn't have the the ultimate power. The ultimate power lies. In the cap- mm-hmm. within the capital. So if, if they don't want to punish Hungary or Poland, mm-hmm. uh, they can't. They can't send but, armies there. I or... t- completely agree, but that's what I'm saying. I'm not excessively fond of the European Union. 
So I'm not an anti-Europeanist, but I but do you see... would like a different story. You, you would like exactly. it organized in a different way. But well, you can you can always reorganize what you have. It's difficult to just scrap something and then build something new. It's better to mm -hmm. try and change what you have, like like nation states or like anything mm -hmm. really. Mm -hmm. Workplaces, I guess. So I mean, it's yeah. really interesting this left right perspective on the European Union. When Sweden joined the EU in the mid 1990s, most of the criticism came from the left. It was considered as a, a right wing project. But then as time went by, I think uh, it has somewhat switched, uh, shifted in Sweden. So I think mm -hmm. the left -wing people are more positive towards the European Union because they want, uh, they're fond of a strong state and, and, and to have, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the possibility of a uh, redistributing wealth and all those things so the, and, and also the possibility of handling um, global issues and the uh, border crossing issues like like environment problems and things like that so they they see that and also the green movement mm -hmm. or fond of the european union while the the right wing well depending on what you def how, how you define the right wing the market liberals are still pro-european of course but the, the right right wing <laughs> They are not as fond of the European Union anymore. They think it's uh, it's too socialistic, <laughs> socialist. Mm. Uh, it's funny. So it can. I mean, it depends on what you what narrative you have, what story you have, what you see. What you want to see is what you what you see. It's if you see my point. You can interpret it in in in, in so many ways. Yeah, there's always conflicting interpretations of the same reality. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Like you have helped me now to understand the Catalonian uh, question much better than than before, and uh, it's it's a very good thing. I love learning things. I love seeing things in new perspectives all the time. So let's hope that this thing uh, goes well for all the involved parties, even if it's complicated, both within Catalonia and in the relationship between Madrid and Barcelona. So uh, where can listeners find <clears throat> more information about the pro-independence activities and also the gender activities, um, gender equality activities in Catalonia today and that you are engaged in? Or is there a website that you could recommend people? Um, there are a couple of websites and then um, a couple of books that have um, become very... I can show you... Uh, it's, it's in Catalan. Um, this is called... Uh, no one's land. There are any feminist, uh, pers exactly, feminist perspectives on independence, and and Terra de Ningú, No one's land is part of a manifesto of the 1980s, in which some feminists already discussed this idea. Look, when we meet with um, Catalan nationalists, the women's question, as was called at the time, is always relegated, and mm. when we are in the feminist movement, and we also want to introduce uh, national claims that does respect for the Catalan language, for example, we do not find space because this is defined as a bourgeois um, demand, right? Mm -hmm. Or um, not, not central to the women's movement. And, and this idea of no one's land, so this intersectionality, right, between gender and nation in this class, not from um, a conservative point of view, but rather just expressing this positionality in different markers of, of identity has been there for, for over four decades, right? So this is the, the central idea of the book, how, how we make this no one lands um, a land of more people in which um, these discussions uh, penetrate discussions on, on independence in different, in different levels and arenas. So I, I can send you some, some links and recommendations um, if you okay. want to. Yeah. Sure, please do that, and I can I can just uh, put the links in the intro text to the to the episode. Uh, that will be wonderful. Thank you. Okay, Tanya Verge, thank you so much for joining the podcast, and and good luck now with your work and acti it's, activism. It's been a pleasure to be here with you. Thank you.